Thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation. Thank you very much, everybody, for, for being here. So um, I actually uh, work on different things, different directions. Uh, this presentation here is very modeling focused. Uh, so I'll have relatively little data. And I'm trying to look at models and construct models that establish certain points and certain behavior which uh, we thought could be really interesting from the perspective of this uh, workshop. We in this course here is uh, Nicole, who is also here in the audience, who is specifically working on uh, this topic, but then also uh, got a lot of input and help here from my student Jacob, who is actually working on invasive species modeling, where we work with the Department of Agriculture and uh, biologists on modeling invasive species like spotted lanternfly. Um, but he also then helped a lot on the biological perspective when we have uh, agents swarming around and sort of resembling 2D transportation of, of biological species. And then Nur Kudari, who was uh, strongly involved in the Circle project that I'll highlight a little bit, um, and then helped a lot on the uh, micro simulation models and, and uh, car following models that we, that we put in here. So uh, two projects that are really important for this, for this work. Um, so most of this, what I have here is almost like brainstorming, right? So um, we're exploring new directions. But uh, some things built strongly on the Circles project that just ended. I'll say a few words on this um, with the other PIs here uh, noted here. And then also uh, we have some active collaboration with, uh, with, with DAC, uh, essentially a funding agency um, that in a broad sense, also has to do with the US Army. And uh, we have these biweekly meetings with Bill Landis here, with whom we have always great discussions. And I'll highlight a little bit some of these uh, interesting discussions that we're, that we're having on this front. So, um, so to give a, a little bit of an introduction, what, what I'm trying to focus on. So um, here are two questions that when um, Nicole and I talked with each other, and I asked her, what do you know about equity? How could one bring this in, these aspects? Um, uh, two questions that really I find I don't have a, an answer yet that, that um, convinces me completely. First one is um, when you say I want equity, does equity need to be based on an ethical or moral argument or are there certain setups or measures or, or situations where um, increasing equity could also arise as this is the thing to do um, if you want to achieve the suitable system level performance. So. Um, so it's not actually in competition to, to system level performance, but it's really that uh, equity is a consequence of this is what the system, what's best, right, in, in, in some sense. Um, and maybe it's even that what's best is something that's really like what's the societally relevant objective function, increasing, maximizing everybody's happiness or everybody's well-being or something, which might be really, really hard to quantify. And maybe equity could therefore serve as a proxy for uh, for, for the societal well-being in a very, very broad sense, um, which is a different perspective than what previous talks had mentioned, where they thought about what are proxies for equity. I'm almost wondering, could equity sometimes be a, a technically pro technical proxy for, for something that's even more abstract, in, in a sense? And another question, of course, if you're in a situation where you have a system that is already relatively close to optimal in a traditional sense, then you might face that you have a trade-off between efficiency versus equity. Efficiency here in the, in the traditional sense, right? Numbers of goods transported or numbers of passengers moved. Um, then are there any higher meta principles, right? How, how to, how to uh, balance them, right? That could guide us what, what to do. What's the best choice? Um, and uh, specifically, we're interested in systems that uh, take a little bit more of a broader perspective on transportation. So we also think of, for example, biological systems where you have a swarm of, of fish, a school of fish or a swarm of insects or something moving also as transportation in a sense. Yeah, you have agents moving things in part because uh, some of these systems, and that's the cool stuff about being an applied mathematician, sometimes you have very different applications, but they describe very, via very similar differential equations, very similar equations, and you can exploit the, the connection, the mathematical connections to carry over insight from one system to the other application. Um, for example, one question that our partners are interested in is uh, what if the army has to serve a disaster area and they have sort of a, a group of, of agents that have to move through a field in, in 2D, like through a landscape where partial sort of roads are, are disabled. And um, uh, you now have to balance the system objective, like maximize the number of goods that the vehicles bring there uh, against that some uh, vehicles might break down. And then, of course, the point is that uh, you may want to have some agents that are, could move forward, stay behind, and assist the ones that are broken down. But then those might not make it in the time budget to the target. right? So you sacrifice some of your sort of system objectives for, in some sense, moral reasons. right? Um, so those are sort of these abstract questions that, that our partners are sometimes interested in. 
Um, but also other ex examples that I'm, where I come from originally is traffic flow dynamics. So not city traffic where you have lots of cues at lights, but really when the dynamics of the vehicles matter, how you brake, accelerate, and then you get dynamic features like stop and go traffic waves and other exciting things. Exciting when you're not caught in them, yeah? <laughs> so, uh, so, and one thing of course that's really, really important is as um, we increase the level of automation and connectivity of our ve vehicular transportation systems, this does not have an, in a, happen in a homogenous fashion, right? So we are facing a, a phase of strong heterogeneities of levels of automation, and how does that affect the overall system behavior? Yeah, so connecting the micro scale to the emergent macroscopic phenomena, that's something, of course, that mathematicians really like to do, and where math can, in my view, bring some real contributions. I'm not going to show actually, I think, anything or not much on these connections of micro to macro, right? I'm going to stay mostly at this talk on the level of the micro simulation, but keep in mind that we mathematicians also, of course, always care about what is the macro limit of these things, right? These are questions that we also care about, and sometimes they're practically relevant and useful, um, in addition to being, being mathematically neat. Um, but another thing we're also interested in is biological systems. Uh, and in biological systems, for example, a swarm that has to travel to their breeding grounds or something and has to stay together for reasons of avoiding predation. I'll show some examples. Ultimately, the, cool, the interesting thing about biological systems is that the, the species that are present nowadays, yeah, they have uh, arisen from many, many iterations of generations and evolution. Yeah? So in some sense, uh, any species that you have nowadays must, within given the right circumstances, and if you had abundant resources, essentially they must maximize the reproductive value, yeah? or at least be, do very well on this. So the number of agents in the next generation divided by the number of agents in the previous generation, yeah? that number usually you want to make as large as possible. All right, so, uh, and then of course the question is, since we have lots of different species around, uh, in including us, Homo sapien, right? So the question is, why would evolution produce species that have ethics, moral, or empathy? Now, I don't, will not answer this question, but some of the things that I'm looking at here will relate to, to this question a little bit, yeah? So, um, so when one looks at equity, one sees examples like this, right? So this is just a, a screenshot, yeah, from, from something. And it's, I think we had several slides and presentations that also had very, very similar formulas, yeah, it's usually sort of a uh, formulate in the language of OR or related uh, topics, and it's usually something that you have some um, money to spend, right, some resources to allocate, and then the question is how do you allocate it, right, within your degrees of freedom in a way that you maximize some objective function, then what's the right objective function, yeah, and these are sort of these examples, and I don't need to say more because we had some fantastic talks already over the last three days, of course, who, who highlighted these things. Um, one thing, of course, that one sees is that this language, this formalism, right, this framework, is not something that can be easily transferred over to a dynamical system of differential equations with instabilities and so on, and control systems, uh, movement, right, dynamics. So that is, of course, one fundamental challenge, that there's no clear recipe how to uh, formulate these, sense, these, these uh, concepts. The other thing is that um, you want to, uh, like on the control level, but you also want to, of course, have uh, swarm performance metrics formulate what, what is it in the end that you say this one performed well or this one performed not good. So, um, uh, and, and the third thing is that uh, the system dynamics that, that some of these multi-agent systems can, can develop are highly non-trivial, potentially, and the mapping between your sort of your control variables, right? What are the things that you, that you can adjust or decisions you make? How they, in the end, through the system dynamics, result in the final performance can be highly non-trivial and counterintuitive and, and sometimes not fully understandable, but understanding the system dynamics themselves, yeah, via simulations, mathematical analysis, and so on, is an important ingredient on that, on that level. Yes? The meaning of system dynamics, because there are basically multiple ecosystem dynamics within Yes, the yeah. Also. Right, so I'll highlight three examples to you now in, in this talk, and that sort of should give an overview of some of the things <coughs> that I'm really interested in. Okay. Yes? essential reason why you cannot transfer these uh, simple equations in your perspective? Um, the reason, yeah. I, I'm not able fully to identify it because the reason could just be that we're not versed enough in the language of OR. Yeah, I would not completely exclude that possibility, but um, I think it's a little deeper than that, mostly that the knobs that you can tune, right, are usually very clear choices in terms of magnitude of certain variables or something, and the way you control a dynamical system are oftentimes very, very different in nature, 
already uh, in in spirit. Yeah, uh, on this. So it's it's um, let alone how how to formulate this uh, uh, um, these objective functions as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, maybe maybe that's actually great uh, at the end, right? When I showed you some examples of the system, that would be a great thing to even potentially come back to come back to later. Yeah. So so the first example that I want to dive in is the idea of traffic flow smoothing via sparse automation. So some uh, people who know me, uh, I've talked about this topic uh, before, but uh, there are several people in the audience who have not seen this. So here's an example of I-24 uh, into um, downtown Nashville, and you see these phantom traffic jams. So if you just think of traffic jams as a paradigm, uh, a fixed paradigm, it's like uh, first it's free flow and suddenly it's congested, and then it stays congested forever, right? So first fast, then slow. But what happens here is that you see lots of examples. Uh, it, it's sped up, of course, right? So if you look at, uh, uh, there are several examples where there's a stoppage, but then the car starts moving again. Then they have to brake again, then they start moving again. And most of you who drive, of course, might have experienced that phenomenon. People call this a phantom traffic jam because you look around and see no apparent reason for it, right? And then when you look from the outside, these stop and go traffic wise, lights, waves, these waves of brake lights that travel backwards on the road and can sometimes travel for for miles. So these features happen, right, when traffic is dense but still flowing, yeah? Um, and the question is, what is responsible for this? Until 2008, the traffic flow community was undecided whether these, are, whether these require an external cause, like a bad driver, for example, somebody behaving badly, an, an, an event like uh, um, somebody cutting in, right, or something, or whether they could just happen from the dynamics of, of, of traffic flow. So that was uh, uh, an open question until 2008. So a group of Japanese researchers answered the question by setting up a ring road experiment and demonstrating that these stop and go traffic waves can arise even if you have a single lane uh, ring road with no on ramps, no heterogeneities of cars, no lane switching, yeah, just from the collective driving behavior, how we, how we all drive. It turns out when you put the right number of vehicles on the, on the road, it systematically becomes unstable. And instead of uniform flow, you get a stop and go traffic wave. And I say systematically because we have reproduced that as well. What you see here is our experiment that we did, yeah, that we carried out. And other people have also done it, including some uh, TV station. Uh, I think even Mythbusters did it to some extent, yeah. So many people have reproduced these ring road experiments. So what I'm showing you here is our uh, simulation. And um, I want to say two things here. One is that um, the IPAM program 2015, of which I was uh, a core participant along to, uh, here, was really important of helping us getting several people here this 2016 experiment going. Yeah? The other thing what we did is uh, the key twist that we put on to that ring road experiment where we demonstrated to get an instability. We said after some time, once the wave are there, let's turn on one vehicle that is an automated vehicle and turn on a velocity controller that we designed with the goal to dampen the traffic wave. Can we get rid of the traffic wave? So that is that experiment here. And the people who've seen it before are bored, but whoever has not seen it, be prepared to be excited. So, um, so this, is the, this is the dynamics, how it goes around. Initially, it sort of starts uniform, but you see everything is human controlled, yeah? Nothing automated here. And what you see is this beautiful traveling wave that goes backwards. Again, beautiful for, if you look from the outside, yeah? Not when you're caught in it. And now we turn on the velocity controller here, yeah? This velocity controller, I don't, go to the, I don't go into the details of the control law here. Ask me afterwards if you like. But in a nutshell, you have some sense of what's the average speed of traffic, and you try to roughly drive at that speed. Yeah? So at the expense of sometimes leaving a little bit of headway, and of course you're thinking, oh, how could that work when there's overtaking? Right? We're aware of all these problems. But in principle, proof of concept, you see that it brings the traffic to a more uniform flow behavior. There's one parameter at the controller, like a set point, right? But the best performing controller is this one here. And you look at the velocity variability, right? This is the velocity profile over time. You see huge oscillations here in velocity, right? Stop and go. And here the amount of velocity variability is substantially reduced. And all that was done was controlled one single vehicle. The rest of the drivers, and we did a whole day of testing. So we did so much stuff to bore the human drivers that we hired. They didn't even care about what was happening. So they were not even changing their behavior. They didn't even know what was happening, right? Whether we were running controllers or not, yeah? There was no visual cue. So this is as close as possible as you could get to sort of normal drivers on the road. Yes? I remember that uh, Robert Herman and Dick Roder in the 1950s uh, basically focused on the stability of, of, of cues. <coughs> basically, I, I'm wondering <clears throat> if all these new developments, I mean, uh, basically to share it, do have the same implications and the ones that, uh, that they found in the uh, famous experiments on the Holland Tunnel. 
Um, so, so you mean the experiments, not the analysis? It's the experiment and the mathematical models of the analysis. Okay, yeah, I will show you some mathematical models. And I will show you some of the mathematical analysis of the models that are there. And uh, I will actually showcase to you how very simple models that are in the spirit of what people formulated already in the 1950s or 60s, yeah, could already explain some of these phenomena. Not quantitatively correct, right, to all things, but qualitatively capture the essence Exactly right, right? So the, some models that were proposed 40, 50 years ago could already do the job. I, I will, in fact, try to highlight this. Yeah? So, um, but what is important here is that these uh, instabilities, these stop and go traffic arrays happen, right? And they're undesirable for the system performance, yeah? Because they're in principle avoidable. If people were to drive different, if everywhere were to drive differently, you could instead drive slowly but steadily. But we cannot change really how people drive, right? Uh, how would you instruct people to do this? Maybe, but I've given up on that. But with this, um, with this sparse automation, right, we have a chance, a few vehicles, this automation will happen to the roads anyways. It's not that we need to send these cars out, right? More and more vehicles have these adaptive cruise controllers, and the human is still steering, right? So it's just we override the adaptive cruise controller, if you like, right? And most consumer vehicles that you get now, or many consumer vehicles that you buy nowadays, uh, have some form of adaptive cruise control system anyways, right? So if this is not the far future pie-in-the-sky technology, self-driving cars, right? This is existing technology that could be leveraged if it's done in the right way. And of course, these traffic ways, I'll show you some quantifications, but I think intuitively, right, this is uh, probably increasing accident risk, right? Definitely increasing fuel consumption and the adverse consequences like pollution emissions, right? Air quality, these kind of things. So this is really something that could have an impact with existing technology. And again, if somebody tells you automated vehicles will remove congestion, Good luck with that. Maybe when the humans are away from the road. But what can happen in, like, when there's only automated vehicles, right? But until that happens, when you have humans, this is something that could work. Yeah? So, um, so that's the stuff that, that we liked and got excited. Yeah? And that motivated the Circles project that just ended, that we carried out in a broader scope with also several industry partners, where uh, we brought it to the real highway. Yeah? So ring road is fine, it's good, it's great, right, as a control setting, but could that, something like that work on a real road? So we had uh, a team together with, with several people, including myself as some of the people who did some, the mathematical modeling uh, on this. But then also we got uh, uh, 100 consumer vehicles, right, that we could have a loan. Um, and of course, much of this was carried out by my collaborators at Vanderbilt University, which I had uh, listed on the slides before, uh, working scalable tech to, to safely override the stock ACC. Safety is a very important word here, yeah. Um, and uh, ACC is adaptive cruise control system. Yep. So, so essentially, like a cruise control system, but it also slows you down automatically when you get closer to the vehicle ahead and just follows uh, uh, from then on. A consumer vehicle? What is a consumer vehicle Car. instead of vehicle? Uh, uh, oh, 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 I see. Yeah. So you, you could have an experimental vehicle, for example, or uh, uh, something. But when, when I say sort of a consumer vehicle, that's sort of the mass consumer market that I mean. For example, a Toyota Camry. Yeah, just one example is a vehicle that comes, you buy, it's not so expensive, right, on the market, and it has a, a very nicely working uh, adaptive cruise control uh, built in, yeah? So, um, and then one th important thing that uh, Dan Work uh, is developing this I-20 for motion system, so that uh, segment of highway, about uh, 6.5 kilometers, is equipped with cameras, about uh, 300 cameras with overlapping field of visions, and, they, and then some, have some image processing or video processing that transforms the real video into the actual coordinates of all, all the vehicles down here. Fantastic system, because then we get access to all the trajectories of the vehicles. That's important, because we send out some control vehicles. Those, we can measure what they do, but we want to know how do they affect the rest of the vehicles up to the level of minute details of acceleration and braking, yeah? And uh, that's what we, um, what we get through this system. Also want to acknowledge again IPAM's role in helping this team uh, to put stuff together, this long program that we had in 2020. Um, and then, yeah, we, 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 we did it, right? And it was like two weeks uh, of uh, working 16 hours every day, training drivers, uh, equipping the cars, yeah, and some ribbon cutting because, of course, it looks good. And then uh, we carried out the experiment. Now, you all might wonder what are the results, right? Did it work? Yeah, and I'm not allowed to tell you. But please stay tuned, right? Yeah, I mean, we, we want to send this out to somewhere where we're not allowed to tell anybody before what the outcome was. Yeah, so please stay tuned what the results were out of this. Um, and of course, I mean, we sent out 100 vehicles, right, on a highway where you have tens of thousands of cars. So that's not the same penetration rate as one in 23 vehicles, right? Ring Road is 25% penetration rate. Here, it's more like one-fifth, one-tenth of that, right? So it's not that, I can tell you, it's not that we got rid of all the waves and made the whole traffic smooth, but was there still some impact? Yeah, 
So that's what I'm not allowed to tell you. But there's a few uh, uh, preprints here. We see a lot about the technology, the methodology, and so on that you can look at. So when, you, when the slides are uploaded, you can just uh, copy and paste uh, these things here. Um, and then, uh, yeah, this is some plot of some, some setup that we have. These are trajectories. This is time four hours of morning rush hour. This is the direction going into downtown Nashville. This is space, this is location. And you see all these individual trajectories going up here. Yeah? Every single vehicle. Um, and uh, the color coding is the speed, the instantaneous speed. And what you see again here is these beautiful waves. Yeah? Again, beautiful when you're not driving on the road, that travel backwards on the road in a very systematic fashion. Yeah, these are instabilities here, triggered somehow, shed here. And then they travel backwards systematically, yeah, all the six kilometers here. Um, and what I overlaid here is some segment where we have our control vehicles, right? The GPS traces laid, laid on top. What also is exciting, we see stuff like this here. So the, these are the instabilities, right? But you also see sort of classical traffic flow theory, people call LWR theory, um, because what happened here was an accident. Yeah, so that suddenly severely limited the influx here of cars, and therefore you get this sudden reduction in density. Up until the accident got cleared here, then you have more cars flowing in again, filling the road, and then you get more instability again, and now it travels backwards again. Yeah? So you get these really, really nice uh, space-time diagrams um, uh, that you can see. Anyways, so still even work in progress, right? Analyzing all the data that we have, because these are a lot of data that were collected there. So uh, cool stuff. Um, Another thing that we did in the process of this is that when you have the trajectories, you don't know what the energy impact is, but the, that's what ultimately matters to the Department of Energy, how much was the energy impact. And therefore, what we needed is suitably simple and applicable uh, um, fuel consumption models or energy consumption models. And what we did in this project is do a systematic methodology that takes some really sophisticated energy model and simplifies it down to something that can be written in a formula like this. That's an approximation, but can be validated against the ground truth within 4% accuracy. Um, I don't want to say more other than here you can read more details about this, but that was part of the effort. But now you can also believe that we have very accurate models for the vehicle energy, given that I know the profile of speed and acceleration over time. Yeah? So I can also post-process I can also post-process whatever simulation I do in terms of what would have been, right, if a car did that, what would have been this energy consumption quite accurately against some references. Yes? Validated against what? Yeah, so there's a software that we use, say uh, it's called Autonomy is the name of that software. Not so important. That one was produced in collaboration with the car industry, so that one is validated against reality. And we validated our simplified models against autonomy. Yeah? So it's an indirect validation against reality. Yeah? It's an Argon tool. It's, a, it's yeah. an Argon, Argon, Argon National Lab. Lab. Yes. Well, exactly. I, I know yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I mean, their software is like really, really complicated. Lots of internal variables, takes a long time to run, right? The, these, these, are, these are lightning fast to value, right? It's a mathematical formula. In addition to the fact that it has nice convexity and smoothness properties, that of course here in reality you don't have to do gear switching and so on. But since we want the large scale effects, right? Uh, this average model is much more preferable. Yeah? And mathematically simple. What, yeah? what is your... Uh, since traffic is changing all the time... Yeah. So you don't really have a with without. Uh, you have with and without but, uh, testing. So with autonomous, with the control vehicles and without it, but but the traffic flow will be different, right? Yes. Instance. So 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 these models take as an input the instantaneous speed and the instantaneous acceleration mm -hmm. and give you the instantaneous fuel consumption rate. So these don't care about the traffic. This could you could do single vehicle, right? Trajectory. I know, but uh, but how do you know? <coughs> how can you compare different slots of time? So you take, the, I don't know what you did, but you did day one without yeah. your vehicles and day two with your vehicles. Yes, I'm, I, I, will, I will show you, right? So we'll do, do two different scenarios. We take the trajectories of every single vehicle, and then we integrate these instantaneous fuel consumption rates from these models and get what is the total fuel consumed by traffic, right? Comparing scenario one. How can you be certain that the traffic would have been... Well, why, why don't we wait until I have it, right? And then we see what's the right means of comparison. But we have these tools, right? So I just gave you an overview of the tools, yeah? And then here's the point about the question, what would be the simplest mathematical model that conceptually has the capability to reproduce dynamic instabilities yeah, and traveling waves, yeah, these traffic waves that go down. And the simplest model, in my taste, simplest, right? the simplest is a little bit of a matter of taste, is this one here, the optimal velocity model. So what this says here is the rate of change of position, so that's uh, your acceleration. yeah. 
Um, Newton's laws of motion, if you like. Yeah. So the acceleration of a vehicle is some constant a times, and then all you do is you say, okay, s is my gap to the vehicle ahead, and based on that gap, I plug it into some optimal velocity function. Yeah. That's an increasing function of the gap. That is the speed that I would love to go with, given that gap that I have ahead of me, and then that desired speed, yeah, that I would like to have, I compare my actual speed, yeah, against this, and if my desired speed, given the gap is faster than how fast I'm currently going, I get a positive term and therefore I accelerate right, a little bit. Conversely, if uh, the desired speed is less than what I'm actually going, I'm slowing down. Yeah? So therefore, I constantly relax my, my, my speed right, by accelerating and decelerating towards what should be my, my optimal speed based on the gap that I have ahead of me. Yes? It will come. Yes. Ah, OK, yes. Uh, how are we doing on time? Uh, 25 minutes, yes, yeah, okay, good, yeah, so, so we, yeah, okay, so, um, so this is this theme, in fact, I should probably go a little faster uh, on this part, because this is a simple model, you can do stability analysis mathematically, here's an example, can be carried out, and you get simple criteria for when you have stability or instability, all right, so, uh, and you can simulate some of these models, there's slightly different versions here, or more complicated models, but Many of these have the capabilities of producing these instabilities. This video here, if you, if you run it further, will be essentially a reproduction of that experiment that we had carried out initially. So let me skip this here. Uh, and one comment, one can do something macroscopically as well. Let me actually skip this here. All right, now here. This is a, a comparative simulation of some of these micro simulations. So this is the same type of uh, equilibrium behavior. So equilibrium behavior is that if, um, if you... Uh, sort of line all the cars on like beads on a, on a string, right, equispaced, and you didn't have instabilities, that is just the spacing you would have when you go with a given speed. So here you have one lead vehicle, right, that's going suitably slowly, and every car behind it follows by the model, but here the model is chosen so that it is, that uniform state is dynamically stable, yeah, so nothing happens. Uh, there's always a little noise added, right? Because when you have an instability, you need to add a little bit of noise to, to trigger the instability. But otherwise, it was just traveling uh, uniformly. Um, but what you saw here, this, here the uniform flow is unstable. And what you actually see is that dynamically, right, you get these waves happening. Yeah? Not in a ring road setting here, but more in a setting of a convoy or platoon of vehicles that, that is happening here. Yeah? And what you see here also is this is a lead vehicle. This is the average fuel over time. Yeah? And as you see, the vehicles in, in the back have a substantially higher fuel consumption happening here. But all right? they're traveling the same speed. That's they're traveling the same speed on average, right? They have to, yeah. And they're all completely identical as a vehicle. And here comes my first equity point, OK? <laughs> there will be more. Here's the first equity point. So um, if you look at this from the outside, yeah, you might be potentially be tempted to say that the vehicles in the back are less capable of driving well than the vehicles in the front, because you clearly observe that they drive much less inefficiently in terms of fuel. Therefore, the convoy has much less reach how far they can travel, right, if they want to travel together. And of course, you also see it. Man, you guys are braking, accelerating, braking, accelerating. What the heck are you guys doing? However, the vehicles and the drivers are completely identical. They're equally capable, yeah? It is just the collective dynamics of the system that produces this behavior. But if you are the leader of the, of the platoon or the group, right, in the front, and you look backwards, right, you yell at those guys for not driving properly, guys or gals. But um, yeah, it's not actually that they're less capable. Yeah? So your position that you're in might affect your observed performance, your perceived performance, even though you're equally capable. Yeah? So this is one thing that one really can see expressed in these type of systems. Yes? Just kind of summarizing what we have going on. We have kind of like a spatial orientation of different, I guess, particles or, or I don't want to say agents, but particles yeah, in, a dy yeah. in a dynamical system. You have an instability, and then, or, uh, and then this, the system is unstable, so then that just propagates in like a certain way because exactly. the system yeah. is like structurally unstable. Exactly, exactly. Okay. It's essentially not too different, just more degrees of freedom than an upward facing pendulum, right? Yeah. It's completely in equilibrium, but when you perturb it a little bit, the perturbation amplifies and it drives you to a different state. In this case, this oscillatory state, yeah? But since this leader drives at a constant speed, 
In the first vehicles, there's not much possibility to develop lots of oscill lots of. And then you have that control parameter, which is like that vehicle that can then switch the system, kind of being structurally. Yes. So simple. exactly. So this is not done here in this simulation, but you could consider doing this. What if now every tenth vehicle or every twentieth vehicle were automated? I will show some simulations later where we could do this. Yeah. But this is the first thing that I think is important from the point of view of equity, right, to establish a point here. Um, so flow smoothing technology could significantly reduce, right, these adverse effects of, of these uh, traffic ways. Um, but here's another fundamental concern that relates to equity, namely, okay, great, so we have these vehicles, we could maybe with some tech and solving out the legal concerns, right, or something, make some of these vehicles be flow smoothing, right, have flow smoothing technology, either work with agencies or the car manufacturers, but now the question is, if these vehicles that have this flow smoothing capabilities were largely accessible to affluent communities, yeah, um, would that mean that the benefit of this flow smoothing would also be restricted to those affluent communities right? or neighborhoods and so on, right? Because people drive in their, in their neighborhoods, yeah? So that is, I think, an important question that one has to ask, yeah? Um, so... Um, here we set up a simple model uh, setup, uh, Nicole and Noor together. Um, so you take a setup of a highway that leads from the suburbs to the downtown area in sort of a typical U.S. city, right? So we have two on-ramps, one from sort of an affluent neighborhood and another one brings in people from, say, a poor neighborhood. I'm, I'm using terms sort of lightly here, I'm aware of this, but just to, to make the point, right? So, um, and the, the, the segments, so the, you have the two on-ramps, right? The, so you have three segments, segment one, segment two, segment three, right? Separated by the two on-ramps. Um, and the vehicles that are already initially on the highway, we call them type zero. The ones that, exit, uh, that enter on ramp one, we call type one. And the ones that enter on ramp two, we call type two. And then, of course, you can play with the numbers. It's a simulation. But what we set up here is that you have 50% penetration rate of these flow smoothing vehicles coming in from ramp one, but only 10% coming from ramp two. And uh, yeah, then one can run this. And of course, the first thing that we do is a reference. So we take a model with parameters so that it's not unstable. Yeah, so everything would be uniform. You still add vehicles here and add some vehicles here, yeah? But, and then there's some, some congestion outflow condition here for some technical reasons that are required. And then you see that you get something, but it's mostly uniform here, yeah, going through. And then here we run the same type of model in terms of its equilibrium behavior, but the parameters about the specific acceleration and braking are now such that you get dynamic instabilities. These will start getting shed first uh, over here, but when you wait a few seconds, you will see that these waves start traveling backwards here, and you get, again, something like the stop-and-go traffic waves that we saw before. Uh, and we have, again, segment one here, segment two, segment three. Yeah? And then we can now uh, augment this by bringing in also automated vehicles, so some that run these uh, controllers. That will start at t equal to 800, right, in this simulation here, uh, up until it's roughly, the third one is roughly the same as the, as the second one, but at t equal to 800, then we will start making some of the vehicles that enter here and that enter here to be automated and turn on uh, their sort of flow smoothing again without details how the flow smoother exactly works, but uh, in three seconds real time, you should see uh, them coming in. All right, so here they are, yeah? This might not be the best flow smoother, and it's also a mock simulation because it's sort of 1D, right? So we neglect like multi-lane effects, but the goal mostly of the simulation is to choose the simplest possible model, right? Simplest possible setup that captures the essence, but you see that they succeed at doing the flow smoothing here. How many snow, um, flow smoothing vehicles are coming in? Uh, here it's uh, uh, every second vehicle that comes in. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a sort of, you can play with these numbers, right? When you have this, so we just chose it because it produced sort of nice, nice videos here. Um, but then what's more important is you can measure now the performance, right? So you can measure the system performance, which is the total fuel consumed across all vehicles, yeah? Where you have the vehicle types, zero, one, and two, but also the three segments, segment one, segment two, segment three, right? So these are the vehicles that enter from road number two, from ramp number two, on the segment two, on the last segment. These are the vehicles that were originally there. These were the vehicles that entered from ramp number one and on segment number three, yeah? But of course, these are different numbers of vehicles, so we divide by the total number of vehicles to get the total fuel consumed per distance traveled, right, over all the vehicles. And you see that in the reference, it's roughly the same, yeah? When you then have the waves, right, the instability, it's substantially increased. And then when you do the smoothing, yeah, then you see it's again substantially reduced. Again, not quite as perfect, but almost back to the reference, yeah? But here is the caveat. There were hardly any control vehicles entering from ramp number two. Nevertheless, 
the vehicles that entered from ramp number two still got almost the same benefit, yeah, in terms of uh, uh, flow smoothing, yeah, than um, the other vehicles, yeah. Uh, and we would have gotten a similar result if we had 0% on ramp number two, yeah. Yes? What if you had flipped the order of the ramps? Uh, well, I mean, the U.S. cities oftentimes, the typical cities are organized that you sort of have the affluent annulus, right, of the, of the, the um, and then you have another annulus of sort of the, the disadvantaged neighborhoods, um, and then you have the downtown area, right? So that was what we felt. But if you wanted to do an inverse city, right, or something, uh, one could do that, right? And what would happen? Um, probably that then during the first segment of the trip, right, the people would face uh, oscillations unless the traffic density at that part of the trip is not high enough that you get the instabilities. Then you might be fine. So the answer is it depends. Um, yeah, but with models like this you could work something out, right? At least a rough estimate. All right, so uh, quick sort of messages, right? So um, systems with integrate emergent phenomena like instabilities could easily mislead observers, right, into false conclusions about the capabilities of the agents, the intrinsic capabilities. Another one is sort of in the typical city, this concept of uh, uh, AV-based flow smoothing might actually be more equitable than it might appear at first. And I know this is a very, very simple concept, but it, I think it's still an interesting point that one can think of. Example two, uh, now we take a biological swarm that wants to travel here and get to their breeding grounds to reproduce. So um, most of you have seen this before, one could say more details about this, but flocks or schools, right, of, of animals uh, swarm together and um, do this despite not necessarily having clear leaders, right? So it somehow uh, happened that evolution brought the species of being able to do this, uh, collectively produce uh, behavior and why is swarming advantageous? There are multiple reasons, right? Foraging, finding resources, but an important one is also avoiding predation, yeah? Um, so I'll show a, show a slide uh, later, but Many mathematical models have been proposed. Here are some examples that are basic, including uh, uh, some important modifications uh, within the last uh, 15 years on this. And um, they produce oftentimes behavior something like this, right? Where the swarm starts out going in all kinds of directions, but then they sort of, under the right circumstances, find sort of a consensus direction in which they, in which they go. And some of these models are even used as models for opinion dynamics. Now, one thing that these models, these basic models don't do is they don't start moving when you start them at rest, yeah? And what uh, Jacob has been looking at is what if we add something like this traffic flow optimal velocity term that we saw before, right? That would make them catch up speed, right? Go in certain uh, directions. And then the model would look something like this, yeah? So without discussing all the terms in detail, you would have sort of an attraction repulsion dynamics here in this term. You would have an alignment dynamics, yeah? That in 2D or 3D can happen. By the way, fish have a sensory organ to measure the, to sense the alignment of nearby fish, yeah? And, um, and then this new optimal velocity term here as well. Yeah, and then you could get sort of here, this is an example simulation where there's an obstacle, right? But the agents can only sense when they're very close to the obstacle, and they automatically, as a swarm, find their way around this obstacle uh, without ever sensing something non-local, right? They just happen to send walk sideways to the wall until they found a hole to go through, yeah? So proof of concept here. So um, this, this example, right? So shark, uh, again, uh, can sense electric fields. Uh, and therefore, they're really, really good at chasing down individual fish. Yeah, they will catch them almost surely. But when they cannot sense a single fish, they, uh, these electric fields overlap. And, and as a swarm, they have a really hard time catching fish in the swarm. You would think they just fly, they just swim into the swarm with their mouth open and will catch something. But apparently, uh, it doesn't work, right? The swarm just splits and the shark doesn't catch any food. Yeah, but when a fish is alone, then the shark has good chances of eating it. So that's one key benefit of why uh, prey fish uh, swarm, yeah, to avoid uh, predation. So now we set up sort of a, a simulation here, right, where you have a certain fish that whose breeding grounds are different from their usual life stage where they spend otherwise, right? You can think of different examples of this, uh, um, salmon, European eel, yeah, other, other fish exist as well, and um, so they need to go some travel, and they want to travel as a swarm, yeah, because to, to avoid, because when they were alone, they wouldn't have a chance of, of surviving. Um, and it's understood in nature that some, some uh, fish don't make it, right? Some get eaten uh, along the way. Um, but you, so you want to now balance of traveling fast, but also staying suitably together as a swarm, right? Uh, if you travel too slowly, right, you don't make it in time to have enough time to reproduce, right, in your breeding grounds, to lay your eggs and everything. 
um, and fertilize them. But if you travel uh, too fast, you might lose contact with each other, right? And therefore all get eaten by, by sharks along the way. So the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. But here you have really an objective criterion that's almost like cutthroat, right? Dog eat dog world or, or shark eat salmon world. Um, so um, where, where all that matters is the effective reproductive value in the end. So, um, so this is again setting up some, some simulations here, right? So this is, and what we matter, matter, measure now in the model is we fix certain parameters to be reasonable, but now we study what happens if we vary the magnitude of the, the attraction parameter. So the stronger the attraction parameter, the more the focus, the emphasis of the agent is to get, stay close to each other, yeah? So here it's comparatively weak, here it's comparatively strong. This is sort of a middle value, and what happened here is they started out sort of in one configuration, but then you get some stratification here, and it formed two subswarms. Why? I didn't say that before. What we set up here is actually, let me go one slide back, because that's important actually. Sorry, I forgot this. We set this up such that half of the agents are able to travel at speed one intrinsically, and the other half are able to travel only at speed one half. Yeah, or well, that's their optimal velocity speed. So you have half of the agents are more capable, intrinsically more capable than the other half. Okay, so now is the question. Yes. Uh, well, maybe not with a ratio of, uh, uh, of two, right? This is more to make the point more strongly, right? But that you have intrinsic heterogeneities around the size or capabilities of agents, absolutely. Yes, yes. So that's very important. Okay? So, um, so what happens here in the simulation, right, is that you got the stratification. The faster ones want to move faster. They also want to stay together. But eventually what happens is that sort of it splits apart, right? And you have two groups forming, one that's mostly the slower agents, one that's mostly the stronger agents, right? So it's going to happen to the slower agents in the fast swarm. No, to the slower agents in the... Ah, OK, yes. So there's a little bit of a pulling effect in these models, right? So it's not that they cannot travel at speed one half. There's a little bit of a pulling effect could model like how the uh, a drafting effect, right? Every fish that swims uh, drags a little bit of, of water with them and therefore can make the other ones a little faster. But they also in turn slow down the faster ones a little bit. Yeah? If they can stay in the swarm. Okay. In, in this simulation, right, because of the attraction forces and this pull effect, right, the pull effect can, can work a little bit. But the consequence is that this travels slightly slower, slightly slower than it would if you didn't have these two uh, red dots in there. Exactly right. Yeah? So, um, and then you have these two subswarms, right, and one travels in the end had an average speed of uh, 0.7, the other one of 0.5, right, and this was the survival rate. So there was some agents being preyed upon. Yeah? Now, in this simulation, the uh, attraction term is stronger, yeah? Otherwise, everything the same. And here it turns out that this remains together, yeah, as one swarm. Um, as a consequence, there's hardly anybody who ever gets sufficiently far away that they can be eaten, yeah? So the sharks have no chance, right? The, the sharks stay hungry here. Um, but the average speed of the agents is not as fast as it was before when they split up. Yeah, that's the trade-off. And if you look on the right here, there's even much less of an attraction. There, very quickly, it separates out. Yeah? You even have a few agents that got separated in the middle, and they got eaten right away. Right? That's, you don't see them anymore. Um, so here you see that the average speed of the fast ones is 0.8. Right? So they almost race off uh, completely, and there are no red ones in there uh, at all. Right? Um, but less survival rate right? as a trade-off. Plus, these ones are slower. Yeah? These ones, they really come in as two batches right? completely differently. It's slower. Survive longer. Uh, yes, and that was because in the racing off effect, that was when the sharks took, because they were very slim, right? Very slender as a structure, and that's when most of the dying, most of the predation happens, right? Here. Um, so, uh, so now what we can do is we can do a parameter study, right? So we can take the attraction parameter, yeah? Um, and um, vary it, and then study what is the uh, mean travel speed, yeah? And you see uh, these are the slow agents, these are the fast agents, and this is the average between them, right? And you see how this varies with a function of the attraction parameter. And this here is the survivorship, yeah? And now you bring in a model for the egg laying, and without giving you all the details, right? You had two different choices of what egg laying models could be, and these are motivated by real biology, albeit not calibrated to real systems, right? It's still a proof of concept, but what it demonstrates is that you could get scenarios where you sort of have an optimal attraction parameter here in the middle, or you have an optimal attraction parameter here in the middle. But one thing that I really like about these plots is that in this range here, you really have an effect that as you increase the attraction parameters, 
the faster agents have a tendency to pull the slow agents. Right? You have that pull effect increasing, and therefore it's to the net benefit of the species at large. Yeah? So that is something that's really notable here, right? as it's happening. Um, there's a lot of instabilities, and therefore, right, there's a little bit of randomness, so one could refine these simulations, but I think as a trend, right, as a proof of concept, this is quite, quite intriguing uh, to see. So on this topic, therefore, um, some, this, some conclusions, right, or, or points, right? So in this case, there's no ethical or moral reasoning needed to justify why the more capable agents may want to slow themselves down to assist the less capable agents. Yeah, it comes under the, these appropriate circumstances, right? Such behavior can be rooted solely in the collective reproductive success. Yeah, here. Now, of course, it's a proof of concept, right? It's a model, but you still found it interesting that such a model can be formulated, right? Such a scenario that could be reflective of some real world uh, biological system in this case. Um, right, so and depending on the circumstances, different behavior, right? Segregation versus staying together could be an advantageous uh, strategy. Um, there's a few extra comments one could make. Uh, but one thing that we were wondering, sort of, okay, this biology, but what could be interesting analogies, right? We didn't have a great idea of other transportation systems, but one thing, of course, that sounds a little similar, right, without having this worked out, is, of course, questions like the optimal level of inclusion or uh, milestones versus growth in education, for example, right? So if students are, learn at different speeds, right, is it better to keep the group together or to split it apart, yeah? So there could be some interesting connections in this direction. Without having thought it more, right, we thought that could be some intriguing uh, connections on this side. Last one, everybody loves penguins, right? So the last five minutes, uh, let me show you some mock model for emperor penguins. Um, some of you might have seen movies like The March of the Penguins and so on, right? Amazing, cool videos and pictures and so on. So here's the story, the short version of the story. I ran it by my collaborator in ecology, right? So it's, a, it's approved to that level, right? Um, not calibrated carefully, right? So, but uh, emperor penguins, right? So they uh, move and then they have to spend the cold and uh, Arctic winter months, right? July and the months around by just sort of standing there, right? And, and make it through until they can reproduce when it's warm, warmer. Um, so they form these colonies and once in the inside are well protected, but the ones on the edges, right, they're exposed to the cold wind. <coughs> and if they were keeping these positions, the ones on the outside, on the edges, would die they, to hypothermia. They would, they would die because they're too cold, yeah? So the penguins constantly have to cycle their positions, taking turns who's in the inside and who's on the, on the edges, okay? So, um, and of course, evolution must have generated that behavior happening without the penguins likely strategizing specifically that's what we have to do. It's just a locally move in certain ways because it feels right, yeah? And then collectively it gives the right behavior for the success of the, of the colony, yeah? So that's sort of always a nice hypothesis one can do biological systems, right? Bio biology must somehow made it optimal in some way, right? Or close to optimal. So um, in particular, the agents inside of the group must be willing to yield the advantageous position for the sake of the swarm performance, right? So again, a flavor of equity, yeah? So this is a simple model that we have here, right? So in this case, it's simpler. It's not second order dynamics, but first order dynamics, just the rate of change of position. So the speed is just an, a term, a tendency to walk towards the middle yeah, of the swarm, and a term that's a repulsion, right? I don't want to get too close to the other agents either. I don't want to step on everybody's feet, because they're big feet, so that could hurt. So, um, but then there's another variable that gets introduced, which is a coldness variable, yeah? So in addition to the position, they also have a coldness variable. And that coldness variable now is evolving in time it follows. Uh, there's always a tendency for it to decrease because every penguin produces body heat, yeah? But there's an increase, and that increase scales with one over the agents that are suitably nearby. So this is the number of agents that are within a certain neighborhood, yeah? And the more other agents there are, the more uh, you get, the less you get an, uh, uh, an increase here, yeah? Again, simplification of reality and reality matters how they're geometrically arranged, but this is a simple, simple model, right? Number of agents matters for this. And now, of course, you could say, okay, well, this coldness evolution happens either way, but now the question is, how does the coldness variable affect the movement? And these are the parameters of and beta. The, the, those we're gonna vary. If beta is zero, then the coldness state, right? The state of uh, being in good shape versus not good shape, right? That's the CI, 
will not affect the movement at all, right? Conversely, if alpha is zero, right, then it would be driven extremely strongly, right? The movement would be driven very strongly. The tendency to push towards the center, right, would increase strongly the colder the penguin is, yeah? And in other words, somebody uh, who would be not cold at all would have a very little tendency to push towards the center and therefore be willing to yield it, in a sense, right, to other ones that have a stronger push towards the center. Why do you call it equality and equity parameter? Yeah, because, right, so again, this is sort of a, a lighthearted interpretation in a sense, but the idea is exactly this, right? So equal would mean that the condition of the agents, right, um, would not affect the movement at all. The movement would, everybody would be equal, right? Yeah? And equity would mean I give as strong as possible of a consideration, right, alpha being zero, as strong as possible of a consideration to the condition of the agents, yeah, based on their movement, right? How much I push towards the middle or yield the middle, yeah? And what is important here is that the state of the agent, the condition of them can change in time. Yeah, it's not a fixed thing, right? It can evolve in time depending on where I am spatially, yeah? So that is sort of the simple model, right? Essentially two variables, or three years, because this is two-dimensional, but essentially it's a comparatively simple model, yeah? And then you can simulate it again and see what happens. So here's a middle example for some choice, right? So uh, uh, beta divided by alpha is the, the gamma parameter, right? So gamma equal to one, they're roughly balanced, yeah? And you see this interesting milling behavior, yeah? So that's what you want to see. That's what you want to see, right? So somebody's warm. Blue means very cold, right? Yellow means warm. So moves to the outside, then they cool down, right? But then eventually, when they're too cold, then they again have a stronger tendency to push. And because the ones in the middle have less of a tendency to push towards the middle, right? They end up yielding the middle, and you get this milling behavior, yeah? And nobody dies. But we also allow for death in here. Ah, that will come in a second, sorry. First here, right? Here, we now do the one where we have the highest equity. So this also nobody dies, yeah? Also, we have a measure, a post hoc measure of how... Uh, how much were the disparities in the temperature that they felt over time, right? So it's less disparity in terms of the observed temperature, the realized temperatures. But here you see, so it also works, but they have to move more, right? So movement also costs energy, so maybe this one might be preferable in this case. Sorry, one second. Let me quickly do this one here. Here, on the other hand, that is when the, you have no equity at all, when it's just equal, right? So the movement is completely unaffected by the circumstance of the agents. And now you see no milling happens, yeah? Not surprising. And now we have a death term, yeah? So when they're too cold for too long, they die. And then they stop producing heat, right? They fall over, and they're removed. And what happens in the very end? Everybody dies, right? Yeah? So that's another example, right? Where you just take sort of a system, coupled ODE system of two variables, right? And a few agents. And you get that, yes, you need some equity for the success of the species at large, right? Without the need to bring in any moral or ethical considerations. Jose, you had a question. Basically. What about the impact? Have anybody taken a temperature measure in the, uh, in the bottom? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, but I have not looked at those data. How optimal is that? Ah, okay. That's a very good question, right? So um, let me actually do... Um, yeah, let, 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 let me do, um, because we're almost done, right? Let, 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 we can do that as the first question, right? So here's a few comments, right? So reality is, of course, more complicated, yeah? This is a mock model in some sense, but it captures the essence of, of what's happening. There's a few other things. My colleague uh, in ecology also told me that actually the penguins have to get to the outside once in a while because if they're too hot for too long, yeah, they uh, essentially become too warm, and that's bad for their sperm, right? Or their reproductive uh, success. So... It doesn't change the message here, right? But there's additional perspectives here, right? Um, and this was the last point was the point I said when, when we discussed this, yeah? And uh, on the penguins here, right? So we had some thoughts here. Again, this is just very lighthearted when we were just were discussing, right? Nicole and I. Um, but one thought, thing that could potentially be an analogy of transportation is that you might have agents on the fringe of accessibility. And if they don't point out, hey, I would love to ride, but I don't, right? They might potentially, if one is not careful, become invisible as possible users, as potential users of mobility, thus reducing the perceived need slash demand, and thus reducing the public investment that that could snowball, yeah, potentially. Very lighthearted, but that was one possible idea we came up when we tried to think, oh, where could one see something like that in sort of public transit, right, and things like that. Or, or, 
Um, another thing very important, if somebody watches cycling, right, there's sort of the Belgian uh, cycle or Belgian uh, tourniquet, where, where they go around, right, so they take turns very systematically of who is exposed to the wind, right, to travel together best as a group, right, as a swarm. So for the purpose of swarm performance, they take turns of who's exposed to the wind, right, at different times. So nice, nice thing. Or, of course, other... Right, removal could be seen as somebody giving up, searching for jobs, right, and things like that. So those were some ideas we, we had. Um, in the interest of time, in fact, let me, let me uh, quickly just do the conclusion, right? So um, we like this stuff, we like this modeling, it's fun, right? But it also you get some interesting insights. Um, lots of interesting stuff related to the applications, right? Vehicle automation biology, but related to equity, right? I think these are two things that I would like to conclude. In complex systems with complex dynamics, it could be, under some circumstances, that purely cutthroat objective functions could nevertheless generate forms of equity, yeah? in, in some loose sense, right? And also, it's critical to distinguish the agent's capability or circumstances from the agent's behavior, from the agent's observed performance or perceived performance, from last, the system performance. An uninformed observation may confuse some of these, potentially, yeah? as some of these dynamics show. Um, Open question, right, which other aspects of these complex systems, uh, right, instabilities and so on, show up in other transportation scenarios, yeah, possibly, possibly in some of the stuff that Carlos was presenting, right, positive feedback loops, instabilities, right, uh, and why does it matter, right, from which principle equity is also, as a, as a last question, right, you could say, well, if we agree we want equity, who cares whether it's based on a moral principle or sort of from a system performance uh, uh, argument, and there's some truth in this point, but Two thoughts is, first of all, it's, as a scientist, it's always important to understand the cost-effect uh, uh, relationships here. But also, I think it's very important for the political discourse around this, yeah? Because how moral we as society should be, not everybody will agree with this. But if there's a sort of a higher level argument why there's a system level benefit to increasing equity that could bring a, a different perspective, right, in the political discourse that could potentially be uh, helpful. Yeah, so those are some... This is essentially the last comment. Thank you very much.